Good evening and welcome to the City Council public comment meeting. Before Mayor Parker calls the meeting to order, we ask that you please silence all electronic devices. For those of you who have requested to speak, there are two podiums in the chamber. The podium in the back is for individuals with mobility concerns. We ask all other speakers to step forward to the front podium. Each podium has a countdown clock located to the speaker's right that will indicate how much time is remaining on your, thir your three minutes. When you get to, sorry, when you have 30 seconds left, a bell will sound, and when your time has ended, the bell will sound again. Please, before you begin your comments, please state your name. Thank you, Jeanette, and welcome to your Fort Worth City Council public comment meeting. I will call us to order. Tonight's invocation will be provided by Minister John McKenzie from Bridgewood Church of Christ. Please rise for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledges of Allegiance. Let's pray. Our Father God, we are thankful for the blessings that you give us, for safety and health, for family and friends who encourage and support us. We're thankful for your grace, your mercy, your peace, and your love that see us through the good times and the bad times. Father, we ask that you would pour an extra measure of your, your peace and your comfort on the family of Sergeant Randolph. We ask that you would bless his family, you would be with his friends, his coworkers, you would give them peace with his tragic death. Father, we ask that you would uh, let us always learn from his example and in serving others and in sharing blessings uh, with our neighbors. We ask that you be with each of our first responders, police and fire, many others who put themselves in harm's way, that you would bless them. We're thankful for them. Father, we also ask that you would be with each member of the council tonight, the city staff who are here, each resident and neighbor who are here. Help us to be a productive meeting, a conversation that moves things forward. Help us each as neighbors to show your love to one another, to share the blessings that we have, and to be a blessing in the community where we live. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Mayor and Council, our first action item will be consideration of the minutes for the August 6th Council meetings. The second Council, any other discussion? If not, please vote. Motion carries. Mayor, that concludes all of the action items for tonight. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, as we proceed into public comment period, first of all, thank you to Councilmember McKenzie from Hearst. He's also serving as pastor tonight. It's always good to see you, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. I know you also spend your time at other council meetings, so it's good to have you here tonight. Um, we have several council, I mean, public comments tonight, over 45, so probably two and a half hours of speakers for those of you that are here and want to stay for the duration First of all, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening for public comment. Um, the first speaker will be Johama Hernandez, followed by Chris Wood. Good evening, Mayor Parker, council members, and fellow Fort Worth citizens. My name is Johama Hernandez, and I'm not supposed to be here. For people who grew up like me, the daughter of immigrants, and the eldest of six siblings, this isn't the expected path. But education was the great equalizer that gave me access to opportunities beyond my wildest dreams. I stand before you today as a proud first-generation doctoral student, something I never imagined uh, for myself. Growing up, I was taught that education is the key to changing my reality and my family's reality. Right now, our city 
is limiting our children's access to opportunities by failing to provide an education that sets them up for life-changing possibilities. We all know that K-12 education lays a foundation for our children to enter the workforce with the skills, knowledge, and resilience they need to succeed. For me, this work is not just professional, it's deeply personal, as I have two sisters in high school right here in Fort Worth. Unfortunately, we are facing a crisis. According to Fort Worth Education Partnerships report, only 35% of our students perform at grade level. Let that sink in. That means seven out of every 20 students are where they should be. This is not just a statistic, it's our city's reality. Our organization, Fort Worth Families Forward, is here to ensure that the voices of charter parents, fa charter families, are heard by getting out the vote and advocating for their school communities. Tonight, I'm joined by several F3 families deeply committed to ensuring you hear their concerns. We're here to show that our parents care and are ready to work together to advocate for the changes needed to improve our schools. I also want to take a moment to thank Councilwoman Martinez, Councilman Nettles, and Councilman Williams for meeting with our families and working diligently to support our school communities. I know that every person in this room cares about Fort Worth's future. We all want to see a bright tomorrow for our youth and for the city, but that future depends on what we do today. We must make education our top priority, and we must act now. Do it for this city. Do it for the little girl who dreams of being the first in her family to attend college. Do it for the mother who only wishes to see her child pursue their dreams after graduation. This is our moment to come together. We owe it to all our students, the future leaders of our city. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Wood, followed by Caroline James. I originally contacted Detective Preston on June 12th for an update on my case against my stalker. He has repeatedly given me the runaround and misled me. And after two months, I still do not have an update on my case. On Friday, August 16th, I filed a complaint with the Fort Worth Police Internal Affairs against Detective Preston for being negligent in his duty to keep victims informed of their case status. I found filing this complaint upsetting because in the past three years of dealing with my stalker, the Fort Worth police were called on many occasions, every single time. The police officers acted compassionately to resolve the situation. It is a crying shame that I now have to file a complaint against a Fort Worth police officer when so many Fort Worth police officers work hard and do a good job. I also found filing filing a complaint upsetting because I come from a military family. My father is a retired colonel in the United States Air Force. My deceased Army brother died as a sergeant first class. In making a complaint against a Fort Worth police officer, I'm complaining about my father's brother. I'm complaining about my deceased brother's brother. This was so painful for me to do. I'm not just a number. I'm not just a statistic in reports that you people look at. I'm a real human being with real feelings. I want you to stop. I want you to feel my hurt. I want you to feel my anger. I want you to feel my pain. Our next speaker is Caroline James, followed by Pete Guerin. Good evening. Mayor Parker and council members. My name is Caroline James. My husband, our three boys, and I live in the Westcliff neighborhood of Fort Worth. You will hear tonight from Brent Beasley that only 43% of kids in Fort Worth are reading on grade level. As an educator, a former classroom teacher, it breaks my heart because I know it will, what it will mean for their futures. I want to talk with you tonight about a group of students who are part of that 57% not able to read. Dyslexia occurs in 15 to 20% of the population. Dyslexia does not indicate a lack of intelligence, in fact, quite the opposite. People with dyslexia are inventors and entrepreneurs. They think differently, they are problem solvers, and they are successful. Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, Steven Spielberg, all have or had dyslexia. Locally beloved pediatrician John Richardson, who founded The Warm Place, had dyslexia. 
There are 174,000 students in Fort Worth Public Schools, so up to 34,000 of your school age constituents have dyslexia. Without proper intervention, they will remain among the 57% year after year. We can make a life-altering difference for those 34,000 children. We know how to serve students with dyslexia. The science is proven. We know what works. For me, this is personal. My son has dyslexia. Andrew was at Westcliff Elementary in Fort Worth ISD, and it was fine. He was floating along. I knew he wasn't reading, and by fifth grade, he still couldn't read. They were not taking steps to intervene, and so I pulled him. The ship was sinking, and I'd be damned if my kid was going to go to middle school not able to read. We moved Andrew to a school designed for students with language-based learning differences, and Andrew has become a confident reader. He asked for books for his 16th birthday. Who asks for books on their 16th birthday? He read both of them. His writing teacher told me last week, it's so good to have Andrew back in the building. Mom, he's such a great writer. Writer? My kid? Yes, because we intervened, and we can do that for every Andrew. I think about what could have happened if we'd left Andrew in Fort Worth ISD. Would he be in 10th grade at Pascal, drowning, referred for behavior? Dyslexia sometimes looks like behavior. It looks like defiance. These are smart kids, so why can't they read? Why can't they answer the questions in class? Would he have dropped out by now? It makes me cry to think about the students like Andrew who are being passed along. The public schools are part of the answer, but our city government and our nonprofit community must also step up, like you have done for childcare, for our unsheltered, like you did for Blue Zones. Education is the great equalizer. Every child must be taught to read. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pete Guerin, followed by Letty Gomez. Good evening. My name is Pete Guerin, and I live in Council District 7. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you tonight. It's a tough time to be in public office. I know it's a very tough time. Thank all of you for doing it. Earlier or later, you're going to receive a report from Brent Beasley, Fort Worth Education Partnership, that's going to talk about uh, the performance of our kids in our public schools. As you will hear from Brent, there are 170,068 kids in our public schools in Fort Worth. 57% cannot read at grade level. That number means that 96,939 of your constituents cannot read at grade level. You're working on a budget right now and that budget will pay for much of the financial costs associated with illiteracy. You have poverty and its problems. You've got unemployment. You've got underemployment, hunger, crime, gangs, incarceration, dropouts, homelessness, poor health and declining neighborhoods and property values. Illiteracy is a significant contributor to every one of those issues that you face as our city leaders. When our schools fail our kids, city taxpayers pick up the tab. The financial cost, however, pales in comparison to the human toll. In my remarks tonight, though, I'm going to go a different direction. As you do now, I once served an elected office, representing Fort Worth as an elected official. As do you, I revere and respect democracy. Democracy is not a spectator sport and it requires leaders like you and an educated and engaged citizenry. Illiteracy strikes at the heart, the very heart of democracy. Less than half of the students at a middle school near my home, less than half the students there read at grade level. Above an entrance on the school building is an inscription. A cultivated mind is the guardian genius of democracy. That's a profound truth and it begins with a societal commitment to literacy for all our citizens. There is a yawning gap between our words and what we do. The Supreme Court recognized that literacy is foundational to our political process and society. It's foundational to our system of self-government, including effective municipal government. We are failing most, most of our kids 
This is an all-hands-on-deck all moment. No leader can stand on the sidelines and let this happen and let half our kids get sidelined because they can't read. Literacy, illiteracy kills hope. Illiteracy Thank is you, a threat Pete. to our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. <clears throat> our next speaker is Letty Gomez, followed by Robert Rogers. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Leti Gomez, and I am the Senior Organizing Manager at Fort Worth Families Forward. We work alongside charter school families to activate their parent power through civic engagement, advocacy, and organizing. I'm also here today as a public charter school parent, grateful to choose a school for my daughter with high expectations and academic support to, to give her the opportunity to be prepared for college and beyond. First, I'd like to express sincere thanks to Council Member Williams for his work on traffic safety at my daughter's school at Great Hearts Lakeside. His efforts have ensured that our scholars are safe while walking to and from school, and also thank him for attending our school games and cheering on our athletes. I also want to express sincere thanks to Councilwoman Martinez for meeting with rocket ship Dennis Duncan's families and supporting them with their traffic safety concerns. Her dedication to following up and ensuring that school zone signs with flashing lights were installed and working properly has been invaluable in keeping our rocketeers and community safe. However, I stand before you with deep concern. The recently re released 2024 Fort Worth Education Partnership Academic Performance Report reveals that only 35% of all students in our city are meeting grade level requirements. This is a decrease from last year, and it's a reality that every single one of us in this room needs to be, needs to, needs to be alarmed. We must ask ourselves, what happens when only 35% of all students are at grade level? What does this mean for the future of our city's workforce? The implications are far reaching. If we do not address this now, we risk leaving a generation of children behind and our city's future will undoubtedly suffer as a result. Our students deserve the chance to achieve their dreams, regardless of zip code, economic status, or race. And it is our collective responsibility to ensure that every child in Fort Worth has access to the quality education they need to succeed. This isn't just about schools, it's about the future of our community. I urge you, Mayor Parker and the City Council, to recognize your significant influence in the educational environment in Fort Worth. While you may not have direct control over our schools, your decisions and support are vital to creating the conditions necessary for all students to thrive. Let's work together to improve the, uh, the outcomes to, and give our children the bright futures that they deserve. Thank you. Robert Rogers, followed by Bob Willoughby. I am Robert Rogers, and I live in Westcliff, and I appreciate being here, Mayor and Council members. I lived in Fort Worth for 25 years before I learned that we had a reading crisis. At that point, I was uh, a volunteer in a program called Kids Hope that pairs a church with a school, and we were paired with T.A. Sims Elementary. I mentored in that program for a few years, students age ranging from first to fourth grade. There was not a single child I mentored that could read above kindergarten level. I thought that was just amazing, and I thought this must have been a unique experience in this school. I also thought I was not valuable to them as a mentor. They needed reading tutoring. I went and looked for a reading tutoring program. Reading Partners had just started in Dallas. I joined the board and helped bring Reading Partners to Fort Worth, and I've tutored for 10 years in that program. Uh, I became more broadly aware of our statistics when we did this work with reading partners. Um, this is a graph of the TA Sims fifth graders. 
And this is the proficiency rate. And if you look, it ranges from 12%, never higher than 31%. This assessed for six years in school, right? Kindergarten through fifth. It's, it's really just heartbreaking and indefensible. So some say maybe the test is too hard. Let's look at another school. Can we go to the next slide? Or do I have the control here? No, good, thank you. Okay, this is our newest elementary school in Fort Worth. This is uh, Overton Park Elementary. Uh, and if you cannot see those numbers, they're 95, 89, 95. Fifth graders can pass the star. Okay, it is not the test. Let's look at another school. This is De Zavala Elementary. And this is what we'd like to see throughout this school, this school system. We were at, what, 22, 22, 24, and then we caught fire. Got a leader that understood how to teach reading, embraced the new curriculum, taught her teachers how to do it, and then we're up at 78%. This is a school with more than 80% economic disadvantage. So it isn't the test, it isn't poverty. It isn't the kids. Kids can do this work. So the problem clearly is the adults. And I'm one of the adults, I'm one of the problem. I am working hard to help solve this problem. I feel like a failure. I've been working at it for a long time and these numbers are not changing. Now I'm not asking for sympathy. I do hope that all of us can take this seriously. Speakers before me have already said all of the different ways and I know each of you know Literacy hurts the city in every way. I want to be proud of Fort Worth. I'm not proud of Fort Worth in this issue. I'm proud in many other ways, but not this. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Bob Willoughby, followed by Brent Beasley. Is Bob here somewhere? We'll, we'll let him get him outside. We'll go to Brent Beasley. When Bob gets in, he can speak. Brent? followed by Bishop Kirkland, just in case Bob doesn't come in. Hi, I'm Brent Beasley. I uh, live in uh, Council District 9, across the street from Days of All Elementary that Robert mentioned, I lead the Fort Worth Education Partnership. We've issued our 2024 city report for Fort Worth, as you've heard. Um, I want to thank you all, uh, Mayor and Council, for all of the ways that you engage on this issue of education. You care deeply, that's obvious. Uh, you've demonstrated that time and time again. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I'm coming to you tonight, and I imagine that others are, is because we trust you. We believe that uh, you have the ability to make a difference. You're effective leaders, and you deeply care about this issue. Um, as people have mentioned already, uh, we, this report covers the 170,000 kids who go to public schools in the city of Fort Worth. That's across 12 different school districts and 12 different charter schools and charter networks. And you've heard the results. People have mentioned it several times already. 35% of our kids are meeting grade level standards across all subjects. 43% um, are reading at grade level. So why does that matter? The state of Texas has studied uh, third graders over time. And what the results show is that of those who are below grade level in third grade, as they track them across the years, less than 2% of those kids end up getting a two or four year college degree. Less than 2%. In other words, we can look at what's happening in third grade and we can predict the future for these kids. Right now in the city of Fort Worth, there are over 7,000 third graders who are below grade level. And of those, if, if the predictions, if, if the past remains to be true, only about 150 of those will get a college degree, two or four years. So how our kids are doing in school matters now, but it matters for the future immensely. That's why I say this is a civic crisis and it's a moral crisis. It's a civic crisis because of what that means for our city. You know, if we don't address the issue now, there are long-term, huge citywide effects that we'll have to address later. But it's also a moral crisis because 
of what it means for these kids. You know, most of our children in Fort Worth cannot read well. That means the door is closing on their ability to access the fullness of opportunity and life choices that they deserve and that they want. We have a moral imperative as leaders to do whatever we can to keep that door open for them for as long as we can. So thank you all. Bob Willoughby, followed by Bishop Kirkland. And Bishop Kirkland will have six minutes because he has a group with him today. You're welcome. Uh, Somebody forgot their stuff here. But anyway, yeah, go ahead and start the video and let's see if the sound's up. I'm not sure the sound's up and hear it. Let's turn it up a little bit more. Uh, I want people to hear it. Can we go up a little bit more? If I was a good mayor, my first act would be to respect the oath of office I took to serve the people who put their trust in me. I would use the media to inform people that January is when candidates apply to be on the ballot and May is election time. I would place term limits and campaign contributions limits on the ballot. I would address issues head on and not run from them. I would not retaliate against citizens who question me. I would replace employees who are not doing their jobs with people who can do the job and reward the employees that do a good job for the city. I would hold public meetings around the city to know what the citizens' needs are. And I would not lie to the public to get elected. I would reinstate free speech at city council meetings. I would restore the city council agenda and meetings in order like it was before Mayor Matty Parker, so that the public would be able to understand what in the Sam hell is going on. I would not ban people from city council meetings for not agreeing with me. I would not censor people who do not agree with me. I would work at making the mayor and council more ease to be accountable to us the people without going through an act of Congress. Other words, I do the things that a mayor is supposed to do. And if I was a bad mayor, I I would tell the people what they want to hear by hiding the truth behind the lies. And with every lie, I would sound more and more credible. I would reduce the city council meetings from four times a month to two and then place on the ballot for a triple raise in salary with automatic raises. So I would not have to ask. I would change the time of council meetings to suit my needs from a people-friendly time at 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. making it harder for the public to attend. I would remove the public presentation from the city council meeting agenda so that I would not have to listen to the people who do not agree with me. I would ban people from city council meetings that I do not want there. I would censor people who do not speak on agenda items the way I see fit. I would not hold public meetings, but do meetings by invitation only with the ones that will not question me about the things that I do not want to talk about. I would not answer questions from the public that I do not wish to. I would protect bad employees who serve me. And for citizens that question the council or me, I would use all the power the people delegated me with to make it look as if they are the dishonest ones and not me. In short, I would do what Mayor Matty Parker is doing to the city of Fort Worth now. Thank you. Someone that doesn't like me, I kind of like my cartoon. <laughs> um, I may use that in the future. Bishop Kirkland, the floor is yours. You do have six minutes. I know you have a group of individuals here with you. They may stand. We don't have to call names, but thank you all for being here. If you're here with Bishop. There you go. Bishop Kirkland, please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I have to start by saying I am pro-Chief Neil Notes. Statements like that get me in trouble in my village all the time. But in the words of Dr. Opa Lee, which I would really like for city officials to refrain from calling her openly, our village see that as a sign of disrespect. Dr. Lee said, let's give Chief a chance. And I have, and I've also advocated for Chief. Our last meeting, I heard people talking about Joel Fitzgerald like he was a saint. He wasn't. He refused to meet with our city's elders. He was arrogant and unwilling to identify with my village until he needed us. My issue wasn't that you fired him. My issue is your timing. You allowed him to load up his offense while the city manager and the mayor was stuck playing defense. I'm so afraid that this council and the city's a uh, relationship with my village is diminishing by the actions of a few. 
the John Ramos, Courtney Johnsons, William Martins, Aaron Deans have created a divide with this city and my village. In my opinion, and not of most, there have been some good steps made in the direction of healing, but to most, it has been inadequate. I'm willing to work with the city. I've demonstrated that before. We have a problem. The Coleman Report, the Task Force on Race and Culture, which I was a member of, the 3E Coalition, the Independent Report, all say that we have issues between my village and the police department. We must face those issues and be willing to do the right thing by my village. The actions against Ms. Rodriguez were wrong. Our village is still calling for the immediate termination of that idiot thug cop. He was out of control. He took, we took in someone else's trash when we hired him. I have a question. Why in the hell is this city, why in the hell are we speak, when we speak to our city about the issues that face our community, we are labeled as Marxists and socialists just because we speak up for the things that need to be spoken up. I don't apologize for being a Negro. I don't apologize for wanting reparations from my country. We didn't break in here. We didn't break in any place. We're indigenous people. We're everywhere. I hope you saw the Olympics. You can find us everywhere, and we need to go on record and say this, that we didn't all come here on ships. Next, Miller Street has to be dealt with. I'm asking the police to be sensitive to the fact that all of our children aren't the issue. Don't paint them all with a wide stroke brush. I don't need the police going down there cracking heads like they did in the 60s. Curfew is not the answer. Chief, do not send the gang unit down there to deal with that crowd. Finally, don't piss me off how you handle some people down here that are vocal about holding the police accountable on this diocese. I understand that they're upset that three of you didn't attend the funeral, but our village moans with the fallen officer's family. But I didn't see a whole lot of city people at Councilman Nettles' father's funeral. I saw the chief, but there was no parade of blue. The mayor wasn't there at the funeral service of Chris or Miss Bivens. And that's all right, because we know life happens. But don't hold them to a different standards. We get, we get it. Some people have to life. If Councilman Beck, Councilwoman Beck, Councilman Williams or Nettles even has as much as a hangnail, or if one of them should slip and fall in their homes in the shower, there are going to be major repercussions in this city. There are going to be problems, and I pledge to be part of the problem. I pledge that if something should happen to any of these three individuals for holding the police to a level of accountability and they have to be labeled as socialists, there is going to be a problem. And we've always said, Bishop, can you help talk to the young people? Can you help talk them down? This won't be the moment for silence. This won't be the moment. Let's go along to get along. We're tired of apologizing when we've done nothing wrong. We're tired of scratching where we don't itch, and we're not bending and bowing unless it's to God. We want justice in this city for all rank members and file of our community. Justice for Ms. Rodriguez. Our next speaker is Loretta Burns, followed by Carla Brown. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, 
My name is Loretta Burns. I'm an executive director of AB Christian Learning Center. We sponsor after school and the Freedom School Summer Reading Program for children in Fort Worth since 2008. Our programs are free to families and we target low-income families attending low-performing schools. While we only serve a small number of children, since 2008, we have seen year after year that most children come to our program unable to read on grade level. And unfortunately, that trend continues on an unacceptable level. We have also been very fortunate enough to be the beneficiary of general funders in the city of Fort Worth and have worked with outstanding city council members and Mayor Price as well as Mayor Parker. What I do know that is we as a city are better than that which is demonstrated in the academic performance of our children. We know that children outcome have not changed and will not change until adult behavior changes. I appeal to this honorable body to be that change. This is a problem that we all should be concerned about for the good of Fort Worth. We need to come together, all stakeholders, to figure this out, come up with solutions, and stick with it until students' outcomes change. No one group or individual have all the answers. If that was the case, we would not be in this situation. We need educators, philanthropic leaders, business leaders, elected officials, and especially our parents to be at the table to come together to solve this problem. The work is hard, and it will not happen overnight. Nevertheless, we cannot afford not to invest the time, energy, and to make sure that Fort Worth has an educated workforce in the future. Children outcomes will not change until adult behavior change. I appeal to you to be the change. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carla Brown, followed by Fantasy Reynolds. I'm Carla Brown. Until the fourth grade, I didn't understand why I couldn't learn at school. I didn't read well. Content wouldn't stick. I wanted to learn, but I couldn't. I was utterly lost. Finally, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. What a relief. Turns out I needed to learn differently than other kids. Repetition, slower, and connecting to learning hooks. After graduate school, I began working in education. After 15 years of working in the dyslexic field, I began to understand that low-income children in Fort Worth have little to no access to dyslexia testing and are not receiving reading services or emotional support. To help fill the gap, I founded a nonprofit two years ago to help dyslexic low-income kids discover their hidden genius. Our first pilot began in 23, including 30 children from the same Fort Worth ISD school. The school had diagnosed one child out of 30 to be dyslexic. We diagnosed eight. Many of those eight families had requested testing from the school and had been denied testing and services. Eight children lost, and so many more thousands of more in Fort Worth. Up to 85% of youth in juvenile detention centers have disabilities, primarily dyslexia. And more than half of these have not been diagnosed and are not receiving services. 57% of children who are in juvenile detention for more than a month drop out of school. These are our dyslexic children. We can't let this happen. I know you all don't want to let this happen. There are three important actions to help reverse this trend. First, 
hire additional diagnosticians. Second, support the unique strengths of dyslexic children. And third, fund reading programs and trained teachers. Once the kids are identified, they can make a positive shift towards learning. They can feel pride. We saw these kids in the pilot making, thank you. Okay, thanks thank so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fantasy Reynolds, followed by Bob Williams. Good evening, my name is Fantasy Reynolds. Mayor Parker, members of City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and thank you, thank you for your service to our great city of Fort Worth. I'm a community volunteer with the passion for children and education. My husband Donald and I have lived in Ridgely Hills for the past 30 years. During that time, we raised our four children who attended and graduated from Fort Worth ISD schools within the Arlington Heights and Pascal Pyramids. I'm here tonight to talk about reading, literacy and illiteracy. As you have heard from the president of the Fort Worth Education Partnership, only 43% of our more than 170,000 school-aged children in Fort Worth, Texas can read at grade level. This means that most of our city students 57% cannot read at grade level. That is almost 97,000 students in Fort Worth. This is not a meaningless statistic to be forgotten by next month. This represents a moral and a community crisis that demands our immediate attention. It is time for our city to strategically address illiteracy and help fix a system that is failing our children. Many of us know in this room that our children's futures are severely compromised if they cannot read proficiently by third grade. And it follows that our city's future would be in peril because these children are our future workforce taxpayers, and parents. As our city leaders, you work to address critical municipal issues like social justice, poverty, hunger, dropout rates, teen pregnancy, and homelessness. It takes little imagination to understand that illiteracy is a root cause of the societal challenges that you are working to address. And illiteracy is an impediment to the goals of our city. So as a city, we cannot ignore this issue any longer. Our public schools are part of the solution, but decades of history show that at best, they will teach only half of our children to read proficiently. So our children are depending on us, on you, to be their advocate. When our kids can read, they have a bright future. Thank you. Bob Williams, followed by Ternace. Good evening, Madam Mayor, council members. My name is Bob Williams. I'm from Dallas. Over 25 years ago, I bought some properties here in Fort Worth, primarily acted in Dallas as a land banker. I'd buy 100 plus lots and parcel them out to builders, only to build affordable housing. That's been my thing for past 30 plus years, affordable housing. Uh, the first ones we built over in Dallas were delivered, three, big, three bedroom, two bath brick homes for under $50,000. Yep. And we built more than Habitat for Humanity five years running. I'm here today because I have two subdivisions. One of them is pretty much built out. I helped get utilities to it. Sandy Acres subdivision had a one inch water line. I helped the city get a six inch 
or eight inch, whatever serviceable line in that neighborhood, in that subdivision. They were on septic tanks here in the city of Fort Worth, helped them get sanitary sewer lines. And it's now pretty much built out. I have another subdivision adjacent on the other side of Cravens. It's in, an, both subdivisions are in the NEDS, Neighborhood Empowerment Zone, for anybody who doesn't know what that means. It's set aside for affordable housing. Melody Oaks, I have thought and thought and thought the best way to do it is with townhomes, not duplexes, not multifamily, but townhomes. Make it affordable for policemen, firemen, nurses, you know, teachers to be able to afford to live in the sea limits of Fort Worth. I'm here tonight because I brought two builders from Dallas and neither one of them have gotten a permit. One of them started the process back in March and made formal billing permit application, I think, in May. They still don't have their billing permit. And we're in the middle of August. And the current demand is with street lighting. Again, I'm trying to build affordable housing, so let me briefly read into the record of Fort Worth Development Services Small Scale Infrastructure Program Preliminary Engineering Studies for 5805, 5813 Grayson Street, two blocks west of the subject. Conclusion, from the study performed, the development met several criteria in terms of program exclusion requirement in accordance with the small scale infrastructure program, but when it comes to lighting, no visible power Mr. source. Williams, your time's expired, but I think Mayor Pretend Bivens may have a question or comment. I have a comment. This issue involves building standards and building requirements. You have to follow the guidelines and the policies. From what I understand, you don't want to put in street lights. You need to work with our permitting department, our building standards people, our development services. Those are the rules. We are not building houses now without street lights. May I respond to that? Yes, sir. Thank you. So actually, let me do this. Let's do this much more productive conversation. Dana Bergdoff is here, who's our assistant city manager over all these departments. If we want to get to a solution, which I think is what we want here, right. let's talk with Dana offline. And then my office will follow up with you tomorrow to make sure you got questions answered as you needed, Mr. Williams. Thank I you. I appreciate yeah, that. Of course. Thank you, Dana. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is my friend Trinace, and I didn't say her last name because I know her. Dorsey Hollins, please, Trinace, come up, and then followed by George Charles. Thank you, Mayor. First, I just want to say I'm so happy to see so many people here that care about education and care about our kids. So as Mayor said, my name is Trinace Dorsey Hollins. I am the founder and director of Parent Shield Fort Worth, a lifelong resident of not only the city of Fort Worth, but more specifically, Council District 8. So I'm here today to emphasize the critical importance of prioritizing education in our city's agenda. Education forms the foundation of a thriving community and city. It equips our children with skills they need to succeed in the future and in turn drives economic growth and social progress. However, I stand here today as a representative for the thousands of parents that I represent and serve about this citywide problem. <clears throat> I know that part of Fort Worth um, City Council's vision is to make Fort Worth the best managed and most livable city in the country. And that starts with education. As Britt mentioned, only 43% of Fort Worth kids are reading on grade level and even lower in City Council District 8. Please take a minute to understand what this really means for our city future if only two thirds, if nearly, excuse me, two thirds of our kids cannot read on grade level. This is not a traditional school problem. This is not a charter school problem. This is a city of Fort Worth problem. Of all of our council districts, seven of our districts decreased. That's an issue. Um, this is not demonstrating a commitment to having a, the most livable city in Fort Worth. And my home school, which is Clifford Davis, only has 6% of students on grade level, 6%. And it's decreasing every year. 
Um, I do would like to thank Mayor, Mayor Parker and Councilman Nettles for you guys' assistance and previous issues that we brought up. But this problem touches each one of your constituents, everybody. I know it's not under y'all's direct umbrella, but it's really affecting parents and families like myself. So I just ask that our leaders really put some intentional focus on improving the playing field and basic outcomes for our children and our city. They deserve it. As one of the most fastest growing cities, people are not gonna wanna continue to move here if we can't educate our kids. followed by Melanie Watson. My name is George Ronan Childs. I live in Fort Worth. Those who collect Fort Worth fun facts can now proclaim that, quote, Fort Worth POA, a blueprint for victory, unquote, is the title of chapter 18 of the fourth and latest book written for police union leaders, co-authored by Ronald G. DeLore. Said victory was causing Carrie Moon to replace the then incumbent District 4 council member. The reason why a police union endorses a candidate is given at page 105 of the second of the aforementioned books, quote, endorsements state the goals of the organization, unquote. Goals is in all caps and boldface. And what are the goals of a police union? Page Roman numeral 10 of the first of those books contains, quote, the fact is that police association should exist for one and only one purpose. The accumulation and use of power, ultimately power becomes the source for enriching the lives and well-being of the police association's members. That is, of course, the goal of every labor union. But in police labor matters, the concept of well-being is expanded to the point of having a completely new meaning. It is not unknown in private businesses for a union to defend a member against allegations of misconduct made to management by a customer or onlooker. However, the vast preponderance of these allegations are made by management. But when the employer is a government entity, every person is a customer. And often the employer is, even in these days of cameras, unaware of possible misconduct until one of those customers raises the issue. Examinations of how Cleet and the POA have limited the ability of customers to do that in order to preserve what they consider the well-being of their members will show that to be one of their major functions. The fact that the customers of a government can seldom move to another jurisdiction if they don't like the product, although the current District 4 council member has helpfully offered guidance about doing exactly that, suggests the possibilities of some customers being selected to conduct direct input to government, i.e. customer review. Next PC, I'll show how Carrie Moon paid for the endorsement by attempts to dilute the police union venom on that subject found in the first book. Our next speaker is Melanie Watson, followed by Rodney Williams. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Melanie Watson, and I'm a powerful parent with Parent Shield. I've been with the organization almost a year now. I just want y'all to take a moment and think about this. Every end of the world movie that you have seen and the state and conditions of it, some of these movies were about aliens taking over some of them were about robots and computers taking over that caused the whole world to shut down. Think about this. In five to 10 years, these very babies that the reports have been run on that can't read are the ones that's gonna be responsible for us. When we have no doctors because only 107 of them graduated college, what are we gonna do? When we have no policemen and no postal workers because they can't pass the civil service test because they can't read, what are we gonna do? It's, it's way, way worse than aliens coming down and taking over because we can do something. We can do something right now about it. I just moved to District 10 
And as I was reading the report, I said, oh, my district looked good. They high all the way across. And then I kept flipping the pages. And I saw the rest of the children that weren't doing so good. And I grew sad. The moment of pride left. So for those districts that are higher than the rest, y'all spend enough time with each other to talk to each other and come up with a solution. True, it's on us parents, and I'll accept responsibility for my kids. But the part that I can't do, which is your responsibility, get the job done. Our next speaker is Rodney Williams, followed by Julie Amendola. Good afternoon. My name is Rodney Williams. Um, I was born and raised in District 5, and I now live in District 9. Um, I am a postal worker. I've been a postal worker for the last 24 years. Um, in six more years, I can retire. But um, I came here tonight to say thank you to local law enforcement. Um, over the last 24 years of service with being a postman, I've had to reach out to law enforcement more than a half a dozen times, or more than a dozen times. I'm a little nervous because it's my first time doing, doing this, great. but doing great. Um, law enforcement has always been there. And uh, law enforcement, I know y'all take a lot of heat from the people in the inner city, but, and I know it's bad apples, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to say thank you to local law enforcement. And I want to turn around and look at all y'all in the eye to say thank you. And they call me the positive postman. With a very white voice. I love it. It was good. Julie Amendola, followed by Nicholas Dito. How, how do you move the slides forward? Anybody know? Hi, Julie. If, Hi. If, there you go. If they don't advance on up there, we can absolutely do it from here. Here we go. We go. Okay. Well, following the last speaker, <laughs> Mayor Parker, council members, and fellow citizens, my name is Julie Amendola, and I've owned and managed Trinity River Farm and Equestrian Center and Therapeutic Riding at 8375 Randall Mill Road for 19 years. Approximately 12 years ago, the city created a utility easement on my property to allow them to service sewer pipes that were installed in our area during a big project at that time. Unfortunately, this allowed easy access to our property by vandals and thieves, and over the past six months, we've had two major break-ins from individuals seen on camera coming for this area. I contact the, the city through our city councilwoman, Gina Vivens, and appropriate officials to let them know of the situation. With a wide opening from the road, no lighting on the street, and a low fence, it was a recipe for success for individuals intending to commit crimes. Within less than two weeks, I received calls from the Fort Worth Water Department and Streetlight Departments, letting me know that the problems would be addressed. Here you, oops, wait a minute, sorry. No, oh, there's a utility easement. That's how easy it is. You see this young man just whoop, over he goes. Yeah, we'll get rid of him because it gets better. Well, we'll get the picture of the fence in just a second. So within two weeks, the city came out, installed a barrier fence at the street. That problem solved. And the city streetlight department contacted me telling me that a plan is going to be in place to put streetlights around our property and on Randall Mill Road. 
We're a small business trying to make a big impact in the lives of Fort Worth citizens through horses. For both able-bodied and challenged individuals, we have upwards of 5,000 visitors per year, most of whom are children. This incident has proved to us that red tape in the form of delays and resistance do not have to be the norm. Citizens and city government can work together quickly and efficiently when change is needed. I would like to thank our technicians, Jose Cuela and Jorge Carenza, for their great and efficient work and for their kindness and courtesy. I would also like to thank the Fort Worth Police Department for standing by us and helping on this detective work that needs to be done now. I would like to thank the mayor and the city council for allowing me to speak here tonight. Thank you, Julie. Our next speaker is Nicholas Dito, followed by Abdul Karim. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Nicholas Ditto, and I'm here to speak about education in Fort Worth. Coming out of the pandemic in 2021, students in the city of Fort Worth are meeting grade level standards just 28% of the time. In 2022, that number jumped up to 36%, providing me with a glimmer of hope that things were on the right path and moving in a positive direction. However, in 2023, it remained stagnant at 36%. And this year, it declined to 35. While students meeting grade level standards just 35% of the time is concerning in its own right, the situation is far more dire in certain areas of the city. Las Vegas Trails, one of the middle schools, has students meeting grade level standards just 10% of the time. In East Fort Worth, one of the middle schools has students meeting grade level standards just 7% of the time. These are not just percentages or statistics. Each of these numbers represents real students whose bright futures are being dimmed by the quality of education they're receiving. This impact cannot be overstated. Our middle school students who are struggling to read and do basic math are on a path to dropping out or barely graduating, unprepared for college, careers, or military service. The quality of education in our city affects more than just our students and our families, it affects all of us. And I truly mean all of us. The strength of our educational system is a key factor for organizations considering relocating here or expanding into our city. For small business owners, it directly affects their workforce and the success of their companies. Improving education in Fort Worth is a monumental and even daunting task. It's far too great for any single school, district, or charter organization to take on alone. Yet, it's critical for the future of our students, our families, and our city as a whole. Mayor and council members, I urge you, help bring everybody together. Bring together districts, charter leaders, nonprofit leaders, so that we can learn from each other's successes, so that we can share best practices, and so that we can collaborate to address the challenges that each of us faces. I truly believe that together we can make the changes needed to improve the quality of education in our city and ensure a brighter future for our students, our families, and our city as a whole. Thank you. Our next speaker is Abdul Karim, followed by Betty Ligon by phone. Oh, great, thank you. Abdul, are you here? No? Betty, you're up. Followed by Alex Jimenez. Thank you. I don't know how well these um, handouts are going to show up on the projectors, but I'm here to address the council about the uh, East First Street bike lane. I know you all are pretty familiar with it. Um, I just became aware of it. I, I travel this street and this intersection often and uh, noticed traffic backing up really badly. Long story short, I called the sign, the number on the sign, to find out what was going on, and that's how I found out about the um, bike lane. So uh, I've watched it go in, 
And I'm very concerned about the road hazards that are being created for uh, motorized vehicles on this bike lane. And also, I don't think it's very safe for bikes. I'm all about bike safety. I have two bikes and I was right into early age, so I'm all about bike safety. I want people to be safe. But I don't think this bike lane is safe for bikes or uh, cars. And I, don't, I can't really get into a lot of detail because I don't think you can see. If you go to the next um, picture, this is, um, this is the intersection that's just been created on the northwest corner of Beach and First Street. And it's hard to see from this picture, but um, the, the first uh, colored uh, area there is, is flush with the street, which is good because we don't want any raised median. See how far it goes out into the street, how much it takes away from the turning angle for trucks. Trucks have a real hard time. I mean, this is impossible even for, it's difficult for a car to make a right turn lane here without going into <laughs> oncoming traffic that's sitting in the left turn lane. I know it's kind of hard to understand this. You could understand it more from a video. But um, so the problem is the second red area down below at the bottom right, that is a raised median. So what cars are doing is like they're turning right over this flush area just to come straight into this raised media medium right down at the right. I just think this is a disaster waiting to happen. And I'm just really, it's hard for me to believe that we're spending millions of our bond money on this kind of construction. I've been working with, uh, I've been communicating with Lauren Pryor and Michael Morris at the highest levels. I started with Iskal Sharithra, who's the project manager. He's doing a great job. And they've been communicating with me about these issues. But um, they've gone ahead with construction, and I'm just really concerned about the road hazards that are being created. And, you know, uh, semi-trailers can't make these turns. And that's a real problem because that's going to cause accidents. I've got a couple of videos. I sent you all an email. Uh, it's highlighted. I don't know if you saw that. Okay, great. It has these pictures on it so you can see it in a little bit of detail. And I think I sent you all the videos about that I documented where these trucks just cannot make the turn. And this is like the worst. This northwest corner is the worst. So I'm, I just want to make you all aware of this. I'm talking to TPW, and today I, t I got a call from Jeff Allen, who is kind of like the person that's supposed to be liaisoning with me this whole time. I've been talking about this since the end of April. Uh, when I first became aware of this bike lane. So uh, multiple... Thank you, Ms. Legon. We appreciate it. Thank you for making Thank us you. aware. We appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Alex Jimenez, followed by Gerald Banks, Sr. Mayor Parker, uh, City Council members, uh, for the record... Mayor, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're the mayor of council people. I think I've broken bread with about every one of you, except for one of you, and I like every one of you. And I don't always agree with you, but I respect what you do. Thank you very much for that. But let me, I'm here to talk with con todo respeto, with all due respect. I want to visit with not only the council, because I don't think anybody in this room or the council woke up this morning and thought, oh my God, the schools are in trouble. But if you did, raise your hand. No. You didn't know? No, did know? I know, that's what I'm saying. I don't think anybody woke up not knowing. These schools have been in trouble. Robert had a, a, a chart. For the last 12 years, it's a flat line. And I think in the hospital, you're dead, right? <laughs> Well, it was a flat line. It's, it's been 35. So with all due respect, I'm going to talk to everybody here, Bishop, everybody. We all own it. I've lived here 41 years. And it has been the same. Since I moved here, we've had problems. What I want to talk to you about is education, enrichment, and engagement. Education. We need to get to these kids when the mom is pregnant. That's when we need to get to them. But how do we do that? Mayor, you have the bully pulpit. Talk to the doctors. Talk to the nurses. That I, they're still being born in hospitals, I think. So if you can tell the mothers, read to your kid. Read to them. When you're pregnant, read to them. Get them ready. I mean, I learned how to read before I went to school. I didn't go to kindergarten. My sisters actually taught me. And I can read. Think where you would be if you couldn't read at your grade level. 
Think how miserable your life would be. So education, it's important, more important than anything we could ever do, every one of us. Read to your kid. The other thing is about enrichment. The old saying, the more you learn, the more you earn. And I'm living proof of that. So if every one of you go out there and read to someone you love, a little kid, teach them how to read, have them go to college, when they grow up, they will be so successful. Is that me? Okay. And the other thing is engagement. The way I think, y'all lean in. Y'all have the bully pulpit. The, the CEOs of the hospitals will listen to you. They won't listen to me. They won't return my call, but they will yours. So get them on board. Let's find a way. And Bishop, let's find a way to get the R's and the D's, everybody together, and work on reading, 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 reading. If we can do that, it'll be a better world. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gerald Banks Sr., followed by Naomi Dillard. Gerald Banks Sr., District 5. White supremacy. Not going to speak on that tonight. No respect. When you took the oath of office, you swore or affirmed to protect the citizens and, and the community in which they reside to the best of your ability. Can you honestly say you have done that when people are steady killing each other or the police is steady killing the citizens in certain districts? They lie and say crime is down, while murder is up, and citizens are mourning from the loss of a loved one to a senseless act. Crime is down, but bake trucks are all across the city. And, and in some selected areas, especially. While crime is up, you get to sleep well because none of this affects you. Because it's not at your doorsteps. And before long, the city is going to be quiet again anyway. Until another wrongful death. Then here we go again. Profiling, police brutality, wrongful arrest, killings, wrongful prosecution, and qualified immunity now. Wishful thinking and false promises while running for office and getting in that seat or those seats. Then realizing that's all they were is what the citizens now know and want some, some if not all of you out but corruption will still exist because you are not really running this city. The CCPD funding should be used to protect the citizens with concerns for Miller Street yes, sir. and others That's right. or other streets across the city. By having a program to assure safety for the citizens and officers is much needed. The CCPD funding is surely not stopping any shootings in this community. So what is it for? I appreciate you listening. Our next speaker is Naomi Dillard, followed by Wesley Kirk. My name is Naomi Dillard. Um, I've told y'all before, I am not a speech writer. I'm just here to um, tell you that I believe that you're not gonna get anything out of a city if you don't put anything into it. And I hope the people on the council know that um, 
the city of Fort Worth is very important to me, but I'll just go ahead and speak. Okay. Dear uh, Mayor and City Council, my name is Naomi Dillard. I've lived in Fort Worth for 20 years. I'm the cur current president of the Carter Riverside Neighborhood Association. CRNA meets at the Riverside Community Center for our monthly meetings on the second Thursday of the month. Several other neighborhood associations meet there also. If two associations meet there at the same time, one person gets the uh, largest room and the other one gets a small room with computers and um, art projects. And at our August the 8th meeting, we had 42 people in attendance. The biggest uh, meeting room at Carter Riverside Center is barely large enough to accommodate us now. In a month and a half, which is our new membership enrollment period, we have 46 members. The hope is that we reach our goal of 100 members. It is stressful to know that the Riverside Community Center might not be able to grow with us. You have heard that um, RCC was built in 1955. Our pool was demolished in 2014. Um, you have heard from Rick Herring, Jan Buck, and many other concerned citizens that we need either a new community center or a substantial remodel of the Riverside Community Center. A play playground and splash pad would be welcome amenities. We have five elementary schools, one middle school, and one high school within approximately one to one and a half miles from the park. Gateway Park is slated to have a splash pad, but a pool would be more fitting amenity for the largest park in Fort Worth. You may have heard that Fort Worth has one splash pad, whereas Arlington has three, Colleyville has one, Crowley has one, Grapevine one, Haltom City has two, Kennedale one, and Watauga has one. Please add Riverside Recreation Center and Sylvania Park to the 2026 bond ele election. I invite you to come see with your own eyes that we have outgrown our community center. Thank you, Ms. Dillard. Thank appreciate you. appreciate you. I feel like you're in great hands with Councilman Martinez on that issue. <laughs> um, Wesley Kirk followed by Jerome Johnson. Hi, I'm uh, Wesley Kirk with Support Fort Worth Art, and I'm here to ask you to stand up for the future of the arts in Fort Worth. I know it's budget season, and typically Arts Fort Worth gets 200000 from the general fund to help with the costs associated with the Fort Worth Community Arts Center. While it was nowhere near enough from the city to keep the building open, it could be enough to start setting up temporary art, community art spaces throughout the city. Two weeks ago, I warned about how the Without the Community Arts Center as the foundation of Fort Worth's entire art community, our remaining art spaces are soon to be overwhelmed. This past week, I've met with several artists who are scrambling to find new spaces for their shows that were planned for the Community Arts Center. I've met grad students from TCU looking for art spaces for their thesis show. I've met someone planning a conference of the best glass blowers in the world seeking new exhibition space, not to mention countless others who have had to postpone their art dreams knowing that there is no longer an appropriate space for them to show their work. Right now, we risk endangering the future of the arts in Fort Worth if we do not act. Without community art spaces, we risk artists leaving town to find more opportunities. We risk art organizations disappearing. We risk a collapse of Fort Worth's art ecosystem. But you can change it by securing and increasing funding for, art for Arts Fort Worth's um, so that they can establish community art spaces all throughout the city, even if they are temporary. We need community art spaces of all sizes in diverse neighborhoods. That way we can all have access to art, access to opportunities, access to culture and community in the cultural district, but also in far north Fort Worth, in southeast Fort Worth, in south Fort Worth, in every one of your council districts. You can make this happen. With the budget you approve, you are sending a signal for whether or not we value the arts, whether or not we prioritize the arts, whether or not this is a city of opportunity and growth, whether or not this is a vibrant world-class city. 
I know many of you have said that you value the arts, and I believe you mean that. I believe you are all passive art supporters, but now is the time when the community needs you, any and all of you, to stand up and be active arts advocates and turn those words into action. Please meaningfully fund and support the arts in Fort Worth now so that the arts will always have a home in Fort Worth. Thank you. Wesley, I don't know if you've had a chance yet to meet Midori Clark. Okay, have you sat down with her? That's very helpful. And I just have one question for you, if you don't mind. You can come back to the microphone. And this may involve city management. To my knowledge, Arts for Worth has not requested any additional money in this budget. If they did, I'm unaware of that. And so it would be really important that we work with the other Wesley on any potential requests because this council reacts to what management presents to us. Um, I'll also make a pledge to you, as I have before, there's a lot of work to be done around arts in Fort Worth, and it won't happen in one budget. I'm very proud of where the city is today. We have much work to do. Um, but you and I can follow up directly and work with Arts Fort Worth on what the game plan is, not just this budget year, but in, in future years as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, que our next speaker is Jerome Johnson, followed by Eunice Givens. Matt Parker and uh, the City Council. My name is Jerome Johnson. I live in Council District 8. Um, normally, I would come up here with a few notes to kind of say some things that I've written out to address our concerns, but I'm just going to speak from my heart because, honestly, it's the same thing I've been saying for the many years that I've been coming here. Um, basically, I get calls every day from community members that are concerned about different things, whether it's uh, crime in the community or code issues or whatever. And basically, what we need you to know is our community is sick and tired of being sick and tired. Basically, we're tired of being overlooked. Uh, we look at the news, we read news articles, and we see all these great things going on in the city of Fort Worth. And we brag about the city of Fort Worth being the fastest growing city in America and what a great city it is. It's great for some people but not for all of us. And we feel like we're in that number of the have nots instead of the haves. Because if you look at Fort Worth, it's a city that's basically a tale of two cities. And really I-35 is the dividing line. If you go on the west side, you have all the nice restaurants, all the nice amenities, all the nice resources. And then on the east side, you have none of that. So our community is sick and tired of being overlooked. And we came here actually six months to the day on February 20th and said the same thing. Promises were made and promises were not kept as usual. And so again, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. I could go through the list, but three minutes is not enough time for me to say what I need to say. We have other community members here. Some of our elders from our community are gonna come up after me. They'll go into more detail, but we're just gonna to have to keep coming back. Every time we have one of these meetings, we have to show up because we've learned in Highland Hills that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So we gotta keep up some noise. And so since we're not getting what we need, look for us all the time keeping up noise. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eunice Givens, followed by Laura Meeks. Mayor and City Council, I'm Eunice Givens. I live at 5500 Stafford Drive in Highland Hills. Amen. Highland Hills was the neighborhood that went to the All American City in 1993. Well, you couldn't believe it now, way it looked. We look like a car lot, still a neighborhood. People come in there and have cars on every street there is, and nobody were working on them. I called code, I called the police. They say that's what they're supposed to do, but I don't see any. We don't have enough officers, or we don't have something. There's something missing, because it, it looked the same every day. I am so disgusted by my neighborhood look, I don't even want to ride in anymore. Used to be down here, I've been coming down here for 35 years. Me, representing Highland Hills. Haven't seen any changes when we got them in the 90s, but we don't have any now. It's converted back to something I'm not even ashamed to talk about. 24 hours a day, train whistling. 
We talked about that before. About two years ago, you're going to stop the train from whistling. But it still whistled, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And then at the ward, we, we have, what, what is this? Let's see. Emergency vehicles. Couldn't get down the street because so many cars on the street. And we have a vile mental problem. There's too many trucks, 18 wheelers coming down the street. We got to have some something clean up around Howland Hills. I can't believe it looking like that. And we, we work too hard, you know. I've been coming here 35, but I've been in the neighborhood 60. Been part of every organization there is for the city of Fort Worth. Even had the All-American City Ward, the neighborhood ward, cleaning up the neighborhood, cleaning up the city, help clean up the city. And what did we get? Nothing. I want to see some changes. This is your consideration, but I need to see some proof. Code compliance, if you need some more officers, hire them. If you need some more po police, hire them. We need to get the work done because we need to see a change in Highland Hills. Thank you very much. Johnson. Laura Meeks, followed by William Johnson. I'm 93 years old. <laughs> and I can't run anymore. I used to could run, but I can't do that anymore. I used to run with my children at school. We would run races, and I would get out and run races with them, but I can't do that anymore. And I am Laura Meeks. I reside at 5640 Cunlin Drive, been there ever since 1969, and I have been a part of the cleanup in Highland Hills. We were involved in the neighborhood cleanup, the citywide cleanup, or uh, whatever. But to look at Highland Hills now, you don't know that anybody has ever cleaned up Highland Hills. First, I want to mention our trash pickup and the garbage. They told us to put those containers out after 6 o'clock on Thursday evening. They are put out. They're there still Saturday morning. They're still there Sunday morning. They're still there Monday. And we have to keep calling and calling. When are you going to pick them up? Well, just put them back out. I'm not moving them. They're going to stay out there until you pick them up. And that's what we do. We abide it by what they said. Put them out on Thursday after 6 o'clock. Our pickup day is on Friday. I don't know whether they are short of drivers or they just don't pick them up. I don't understand. And then I have another problem here. And that is, I think Sister Gibbon talked about the number of cars on the street. Well, I'm also complaining about cars on the street. I'm also complaining about uh, trailers. You go up and down the street, you find long bed trailers on the street. I don't know why, but they are parked on the street. Also, there are trailers where they are having, like I said, running a business out of a garage. 
I complained about that so much until I just got tired and I stopped really calling. But as you travel around that little circus, a very short street, well, anyway. Miss Meeks, I, I don't ever do this, but you're 93 and you came all the way down here. If you want to finish your comments, you absolutely may. I think you have privileged. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as I said, there is a trailer that has been parked on this little short street a long, long time. And they do use it because I think there is business being run out of the garage. I have seen tables in the uh, saw, you know, they make the mm-hmm. saw that they cut things with mm-hmm. in the driveway. Sometime I pass by there, the garage door is up, and I can see all of the equipment and everything in the garage where they're running out this business. And asked that the trailer could be moved, and I think they told our officer that the trailer was there and those trucks were there because those workers would come, park their trucks on each side of the street and pull rides going to their jobs. But I don't think that's the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, like I said, the garage door is up sometime. And if the garage door is up, I'm going to look. <laughs> Meeks, we appreciate you very much. Sounds like we've got a lot of due diligence to do and sit down so, with you and, and Mr. Johnson, so we'll do that. Okay, and okay. I, but I just want you to know, and I just say, you know, and they're talking about the cleanup and cleanup, and as we were coming over here tonight, I asked the driver, I said, would you just drive down Glasgow? And what did we see? It just looked like the dump yard out there. Thank you, Ms. Meeks. Our next speaker is William Johnson, followed by Manuel Mata. I'm 87. <clears throat> Mayor Parker. <clears throat> the, the Mayor Parker, city staff. First, I want to mind the job that y'all are doing out here. And my council member, District 8, Reverend Nelton. Here again, William Johnson. I'm here to give a report. I didn't get a chance to get all the information I need to get. I talked to Reverend Johnson, who is uh, president at Highland Hill. But one of our young neighbor, the latter part of July, early part of August, was walking on Henson Drive in Highland Hill, and two white cops beat him up. And it, it's, uh, he was, uh, he had to go to the hospital. From there he went to jail. His name, his name is uh, Daryl Young. And uh, I don't know what he was doing, but regardless of what he was doing, he shouldn't be, he should have been arrested maybe, whatever he was doing. And uh, he said, he just walked alone. And they said, you look like the guy that we saw in a stolen car. He said, how in the age I'm going to be in a stolen car and I'm walking? And, they, and then they find out in one of the conversations, one of the guys said, oh, we think we got the wrong guy. But they carried him to the hospital, and I, I saw the stitches and everything and the scars. Uh, uh, they did a pretty good job on both of them. And they trailed him until he got in the dark, and he started running. That's why... I, that's why that's one of the reasons he said he, they beat him up because he ran. Well, if he hadn't run, I wonder what would have happened to him. So anyway, we can't have this in Highland Hill, and we can't have it nowhere in forward, and we don't want nowhere in the world for cops that you know that's supposed to be protecting the citizen. Two of them take advantage and beat this guy, and they beat him pretty bad too. And I'm sure it's record here somewhere. I didn't get a chance to talk to Reverend Johnson on it because I just got most of the information, the little bit I got today. I tried to get him to come up tonight. But, but anyway, that needs to be looked into, and we expect to have some kind of report on that uh, probably pretty quick because it, uh, it's, it's, it's available. 
It's in Rucker somewhere. They're all young, beat up by two white cops. And anybody that know me, they know I don't play the race car. But this stuff must stop anywhere in Fort Worth or in the country. Thank you so much, and I appreciate this. Manuel Mata, followed by Gloria Shepard. <clears throat> My name is Manuel Mata. I'm in District 9. And I came today because this is the fifth time I've came to address body cam footage for the Fort Worth Police Department because I got mine from a Fort Worth police officer pulling his gun on me for jaywalking, and he muted his body camera when he was lying to the police, to the sergeant. Him and three other officers muted their body cameras, right? And there's also something that was constructed in Dallas because of a police officer turning off her body camera after she murdered someone in his apartment. And it's called Bo's Law. It's a third degree felony for any police officer to mute, turn off their body camera during an investigation. This is the third set of body cam footage I have received that I paid for, where officers are muting their body cameras when they're in a circle, lying, getting their lives together to CYA. And y'all know what that is, right? So my whole thing is I am going to sit here and call out five police officers because they're good police officers. Mr. Calzada, Officer Castaneda, Officer uh, Payan, Officer Little, Officer Brasino, all these officers respect my right to film anything that cops do while they're in their official capacity. They don't have to bunch up and lie because they did something wrong that they know is wrong, right? And I am tired of being your scapegoat, their scapegoat, because they want to blame me that I'm this guy that comes out and just irritates all of them. And there's this little saying that they put in my police road. It is known that Mr. Mata films police activities. And not only that, I bait police officers into confrontation because I'm after lawsuits, right? And make money off of my YouTube channel. I dare anyone to show me a YouTube check in the past six years that I've been filming. I dare any one of y'all to come at me with a lawsuit right now. I'm trying to handle it reasonably. Right? Because nobody holds bad cops accountable. There's a sergeant suing the chief of police right now for doing her job. And she got fired, demoted, because she hold bad hot cops accountable. Those are the cops we need doing their job. Cover up, it needs to stop. Because I done figured out, I learned how to sue y'all by myself. Our next speaker is Gloria Shepard, followed by Adrian Smith. Hello, Mayor um, Parker and city council members. I am Gloria Shepard. I'm a resident of Highland Hills. My address is 5608 Conroy Street. I have lived there for, with my husband for 52 years. And men, but since then, me and my husband has raised three kids there, and we want to enjoy the rest of our lives on Conroy Street. But it always seems as if the years go by, as years go by, things are coming in our neighborhood that make it uncomfortable for us to enjoy our surroundings. Warehouses are being built up all around. People, we have people that, that don't live in our community, but they own property in the neighborhood, and they don't care how their property is being used by the renters. Coming into neighborhood Highland Hills, there is a club on the corner, a car wash not in service, a service station that is not being kept, a storefront, and a grocery store that is being used for things that don't benefit the neighborhood. None of these things benefit the neighborhood. You pass by that grocery store and, at night and there's people just hanging all out around it, doing nothing, going in and out. 
And then there's graffiti that is all over those little stores. They've even put it on the car wash. All kind of graffiti. They said it's a mural, but it's really not a mural. It's graffiti. It's very ugly coming into the neighborhood. And it doesn't make our neighborhood pleasant at all. In fact, it looks really awful. Like, who, what is you coming into? It's just like a lot of thugs hanging around. And we would like for something to be done about that. We have a 10 fence that's right by the car wash that's around some people that put a 10 fence around some houses. And that doesn't look well either. A tin fence. Can you imagine that if somebody came into your neighborhood and there was this big tin fence there? It, it, it looks bad. And uh, surrounding some houses next to the service station. Trees are growing up and grass that need to be cut. That's behind the street where I live. And the people have the nerves now to want to put uh, some, some things back there, but they're not even keeping it up. The trees have grown through the years. We have called, and they always said that they're over, overbuilt. You know, so many people are there, and so many other people are, are having them to come and cut their grass from the city or either from the people that own the place. And they're not doing anything. And the trees and everything are growing up, and we can't afford to do all of that. And so it's all around Conroy Street, and it's really bad. It makes it look, and then there's, you know, when, if we didn't have cats or something like that, we'd have a lot of rats. And then there's a lot of stuff come, you know, things come up out of the, out of that, out of all that grass and stuff. And we don't know what all is back there. Thank so, you, Ms. Uh, and we can't move. We can't move. I just need to say this. We need y'all's help. And yes, we don't need it in the next uh, three or four years. We need it now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Mm -hmm. Shepard. Our next speaker is Adrian Smith, followed by Cliff Sparks. Adrian Smith, I am one with the people. August the 25th, 2024, will mark the one year anniversary that I, Adrian Smith, was trespassed from this very council chamber. For a six month period, I was trespassed, and myself, Mr. Bob Willoughby, the gentleman that gave you all the video presentation. So, this right here, I'm going to frame it, but I just want to bring people into what brought me to this point tonight. My one year anniversary, six months, Pastor Tatum, Pastor Kirkland, I called it my Moses moment. I was in the wilderness for six months and my restrictions were greater than Bob's. I had greater restrictions than Bob's. The intended purpose, was it to discourage me, to silence me, or to remind me of my place? My ancestors, they were made to feel discouraged. They were often silenced they were often reminded of their perceived place within this country. They truly live through limits so I can live without limits. My desires going forward, my presence will be greater, my voice will be louder, and I will do with them, I will do what's, I will, I will do what's necessary within my power to ensure that these council chambers are full. What you did, Mayor, thank you. You awoke a greater purpose within me. Now, as I take my seat, I recall back in, and this is not a campaigning moment. We're not in the campaign season. But I do recall back in 2023 when I gave my service to be the mayor of this city, that childhood literacy and education was one of my focal points. So in saying that, the success of our youth determines the, the success of our world. And in closing, if we, can't, if we cannot get it done with those who are currently elected, we must elect those who will get it done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cliff Sparks, followed by Malik Austin. Hi, Cliff Sparks, District 5, Jenna Bivens. I'm here to talk about Miller Avenue. Miller Avenue. Something has to be done. Sick and tired of sick and tired of the violence going on in the community, especially on Miller Avenue. Me and TJ stopped the block party from going on on Friday night. Sit out in the parking lot. 
PD came out and made sure the block party didn't go on. They wanted to celebrate a rapper out of Houston, B. King, not even known in Fort Worth. You listen to his music, okay. But you're not gonna come in our community. It's not gonna be another 4th of July. Not gonna be no more shootings, having block parties and people getting killed. So happened we didn't catch the next day, which was Saturday, a fight started at a crew lounge on South Hewlin, and it ended up on Miller Avenue, where, where seven fights and a shooting occurred. Enough is enough. Yes, sir. Reached out to city council, Chris Nettles. I don't know who district it is, but we need to get together, come up with a solution, and fix the problem. It can no longer happen in this community. And it start with the city of Fort Worth, it start with community leaders, and it start with and the, the, the it start with the parents as well. Teach your kids, stop hanging out on Miller. It's not a hangout spot. Kids walking around with guns, hanging out their backpacks, hung, hanging out their pockets. It is unacceptable. So we, it's, something has to be done. Second thing I want to talk about is child care. Had a meeting with CCA, with a lot of child care providers. They blame y'all that y'all approved them to build six daycares in the city of Fort Worth. How in the hell? You put in six daycares in the city of Fort Worth. When it's, it's several daycares in the city of Fort Worth. CC, CCA getting funded. They're not giving us any money. So how do they expect for us to provide for the families that's in need? Tell me how. They want to put one on Ramey Avenue. I'll be damned if I let one go up on Ramey Avenue. I get 2,000, 600,000 signatures before one go up on Ramey, on Ramey Avenue. It don't make no sense. You got three daycares on Stall Cup, you got one was across the street at Sweet Home. Don't know if it's still there, but you want to start the study coming to our communities and take from the daycares that's trying to, that's trying to strive and trying to make, to make sure these kids have great education. Reading start early. It started with the child care. It started with child care. If your kids don't know how to read, let's, let's come up with a solution and, and, and figure it out. And it starts with the city, it starts with the parents, and it starts with the community leaders. Let's make a difference. Our next speaker is Malik Austin, followed by James Smith. Good evening to the mayor and council. As Ms. Johnson, Mr. Johnson and the rest of Holly Hill, I was born there and came to Holly Hills in 73 from come up. Uh, this MSD that I was informed by one of my, my barber actually, uh, grew up in District 8, I love District 8. Uh, I wasn't satisfied with this MSD. Uh, when we researched the codes, this is kicked back to a landfill. I know about the contamination behind my neighborhood, was punished for going behind that particular area where they tried to put this site plan. Uh, it was a little pun. Uh, it started in the 40s with Texas Steel uh, disposing waste that consisted of manganese, lead, arsenic, zinc, all the things that you don't want to get exposed to. Uh, we didn't stand for it. I think uh, Estelle Williams, president of the NAACP, I think that uh, District 95, Nicole Carrier, for coming out to support us, and we was able to collectively get that MSD put on hold. So I'm going to give you a notice, Mayor. I am a descendant from McLennan County, <laughs> uh, that we're not going to tolerate it. So it needs to go away. If you disturb these chemicals, it kicks off a gas, what you call HS2. I've done my homework as an engineer. Uh, and it also could affect your water, drinking water, uh, clean, fresh water, storm drain. You got to go about 17 feet when you drill in, et cetera. This is not acceptable. We have seniors here. We have people that's livable. People enjoy that. And we are already surrounded by industrialization anyway. And so that type of contamination, when your code tells us this is going to be a landfill behind where it butts up to Ms. Shepard's home, 57.5 uh, acres, they say 14 of it is residential. And so uh, what they trying to, Whitehead is trying to do, Mayor, is get around the retention plan. They don't want to clean up, which is going to cost them millions and millions of dollars. What profoundly uh, struck me is that the lady that represents uh, Blair Holding said, oh, when the MSD going to pass, wait a minute, hold up. 
Who are you talking to? And who, how did it even get this far? But we appreciate that next time we had something that, that critical, take time out when we dealing with environment to come to our neighborhood and address this. And we ask this, that we be permanently not visited anymore or we gonna stand up and fight for this type of contamination to be uh, exposed for the community that the people I love, I still have relatives in that neighborhood. So we're not gonna tolerate it. We ain't gonna stand for it. So you can tell Blair Holden, whoever took the money, give it back to him. I don't care. So yeah, while well, I say it, I ain't going away. Thank you. James Smith followed by Aubrey Barr. And Mr. Austin, have you met Dr. Wittenberg before, Cody, who's an environmental services director? Okay, I'll, I'll just make sure the right person follows up with you to discuss that more. Thank you. He's not here tonight, otherwise I would introduce you, but thank you. Mr. Smith, followed by Aubrey Barr. Uh, good afternoon, Council. My name is James Smith. I live in District 8. I was six years old when President Kennedy was killed in Dallas. That memory rings clear 60 years later, as other tragic accidents in my lifetime. I don't expect October the 12th, 2019, to be any different. Good thing, I guess, is I don't have 60 more years. It's been almost five years, it'll be five years in October. The city of Fort Worth has a plethora of problems, as I've heard tonight and other weeks that I've been here. You guys have work to do. I realize you pass things to your legal department. And from what I'm reading in the news and what I hear down here, your legal department has a stack of problems to deal with. They work for you. Get with your legal team, ask them what's going on. Let's move this forward so I can move forward. Three years ago, I was broken. Two years ago, I was imprisoned in my own home. And just today, I need therapy. I do. But I'm not taking any therapy until you finish your job. Yes, this is my therapy. I promised to Tatiana's mother that I would be here to advocate for her daughter, and I'm here. Police policy procedure, police policy procedure, I'm gonna say this again, police policy and procedure needs to be followed according to the policy and the procedure. Not following the policy and the procedure led to a Tatiana's death. I stand here and I realize that my councilman was criticized for not attending the officer's funeral, as well as Jared and Miss Beck. I was watching that processional through a blogger, play by play, because I'm a citizen of Fort Worth and I wanted to see that. That blogger was kicked off the church property. She knew him. She came to pay her respects, and she was kicked off that property. And I watched her cry because she was there because she was concerned. That touched me, as well as the continued arrest of Manuel Mata, who over the past few years has done nothing illegal to be arrested and handcuffed and put in the Tarrant County Jail. That's right. That's right. This bothers me. And I'll get therapy when the city of Fort Worth does its job. Mr. Smith. Our next speaker is Aubrey Barr, followed by David Martinez. Is Aubrey here? Maybe yeah, by, by phone? phone. Okay. And David Martinez also by phone. Aubrey? Yeah. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yes. You have three minutes, please. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council members. I am Aubrey Barry. I am Malik Austin's barber, which I received a letter from Whitehead and LLC, Bear Holding the LLC. And I am in agreement with him as long as they want to violate us. I, like I told him at our community meeting, I was started in every community meeting. 
and I'll walk door to door and get a petition signed by every person I know or don't know in Holland Hills, Edgecliff, whatever they've called it now, because this thing they want to build is a fraudulent, the way they presented it, it was wrong. And for Holland Hills, damage Holland Hills and our community, it is wrong. They building up everything but Holland Hills. That's all I can say. They just want to go on record that I against this, whatever they want to build on the, how, the 35 South Freeway. Thank you. David Martinez by phone, followed by Liz Badgley. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is David Martinez, District 8. Uh, uh, I, went, I attended the uh, uh, Fort Worth Public Arts meeting yesterday, last night, and well, it was over at the Siquio Vasquez Park. And uh, we approved the uh, artwork that was placed in there. I actually, I really love it. I went up there to go and and, and hate on the project, but because I wasn't informed. But uh, when I showed up, I saw that I saw family members there, and then I saw the community there. So uh, thankful for that. I'm, I'm I'm grateful that we're being included in the artwork that's in Southside. Um, I appreciate that. But next time, uh, give me a heads up if you're going to put artwork in Carter Park. Uh, I'd like you to contact me and let me know. Um, also, uh, I wanted to bring up the, the situation with the forward PD thing with the uh, the council people. I, I don't want to get into it. I, I don't want to give it any more energy than it needs. I just want everybody to uh, calm down and everybody to uh, focus on what this is all about. And it's about protecting the city. That's what matters. Our children is what matters. Okay. So, I mean, we can go back and forth and keep this going on and on through the election time, but I'd rather deal with it, go forward and, and move forward and, and work on things like having DWI checkpoints so this don't happen again. So no more officers and no more citizens get ran over by drunk drivers. We need DWI checkpoints, and those DWI checkpoints will be used to, to calm down the crime that's going on on the weekends at night in Southside and Northside and West 7th Street. That's what we need to focus on. I'm here for solutions. I'm not here to complain. I'm here to work with anybody who will try to uh, do what I'm trying to do is to protect the, the community and do what's right. And, and we and we need to stop this Republican and Democrat stuff right there because this is people. These are people. Uh, we all need protection. So that's all I had to say today. Thank you. God bless. Liz Badgley followed by Tina James. Good evening, Council. Thank you for allowing me. Oh, sorry, y'all. Uh, my name is Liz Badgley. I live in District 5. But uh, thank you all for allowing me to address yet another matter of grave concern, the rising gun violence in our city. This is more than a statistical issue. It affects our families, our neighborhoods, and our collective sense of security. In 2023, we saw a significant and tragic event that underscored the severity of our situation. The death of West Smith was a heartbreaking incident that unfortunately was not an isolated case. It was a stark reminder of the rising gun violence plaguing Fort Worth. In response, Mayor Maddie Parker took swift action, enacting changes for 7th Street within just three days of the tragedy. This rapid response demonstrates that when faced with immediate pressure, de decisive action can be taken. However, prior to this, there was a troubling pattern of denial and dismissal regarding the severity of the gun violence in our city after the District 5 death of Treshawn Younes on Brentwood Stair. This sends a message that this council only cares about the predominantly white community. For too long, Mayor Parker and others in leadership positions have downplayed or outright denied the existence of a gun violence epidemic in the media. Public statements mocking those who called for citywide solutions only served to further alienate concerned citizens and hinder meaningful progress. It is essential that we learn from these past missteps and recognize the urgency of addressing the gun violence that is plaguing our city proactively rather than reactively. The recent changes on 7th Street, while commendable, should not be seen as a one-off response to an isolated incident. They should serve as a catalyst for broader systematic change. Our city is known for its strong sense of community and resilience, supposedly known as the Fort Worth Way. 
Yet, as gun violence continues to rise, it tests the very fabric of what makes Fort Worth a great place to live. It challenges our commitment to safety and the well-being of every Fort Worthian. We must recognize that this is a multifaceted problem that requires a comprehensive and collaborative approach. Addressing gun violence demands not only immediate actions, but also long-term strategies to address its root causes. And here are some areas that we need to focus on. We need to foster trust and collaboration between law enforcement and the communities that the forward police serve. Building a police force that Fort Worthians can trust will facilitate stronger relationships between the community and the police, leading to better intelligence and more effective crime prevention. We must work together to engage community members in finding solutions, and by working together and supporting each other, we can build a united front against gun violence. Our city council has the power to drive meaningful change, but it also requires courage and commitment from each of us. We must be proactive. We must be united, not divided. Let's honor the lives affected by gun violence by working diligently to create a Fort Worth where every individual feels safe and secure. Together, we can build a safer city for all. Thank, Thank you, you, Liz. May I ask a quick question, Liz? Yes, absolutely. Are, are you aware of the work we're doing alongside United Way and the One Second Collaborative? Unfortunately, um, it's okay to say no. That's just helpful in, insight for us. Yes. Yeah, so don't know. the okay. United Way doesn't open up their doors to every citizen. They have been known to shut others out who they may not agree. I think with. we might agree to disagree, but that's helpful. There's a lot of there's a lot of communication working on that with United Way. So I'll I'll, I'll follow up with you separately. I appreciate you answering my Thank question. You, Mayor. Thank I'm you. I'm looking forward to very meeting much. with you. Soon. Thank you very much, Miss James, followed by Martasha James. Good afternoon, Tina James with the two E's. I'm coming from the capital of Fort Worth, stop six, right? So as of uh, April 30th, 224, gun homicides are down by 13%, 13.1% 13 in 2024, compared with the same time in 2023, that was down by 16.4% year to date. Moving forward, Texas has the largest gun sales. 1,347,589 gun sales just in Texas alone. And with that being said, um, we've just Jane, um, July the 5th, we had um, so many deaths on July 5th from July 4th. That was a death of killings over in the, I noticed how Channel 5 kept saying stop six, stop six, stop six. But all the gun violence wasn't in stop six. They kept using the community. Uh, stop 6 is a great place to live and raise your family in. I am a prime candidate for Stop 6. I've raised four children, all with their masters, with an exception of one who's finishing next year. Married 30 years, built a five-bedroom, four-bath house in the Stop 6 area. At one point in time, Council Bivens even put me on her board for supporting the different things that was happening in Stop 6. One of the things that I want to say that on July 5th, um, Myself and some more leaders actually responded to the situation of the deaths. Ten minutes apart, Councilman Drive, Cal Councilman Drive, ten minutes. The next ten minutes was over in Stop Six. The next ten minutes was over in Crowley. Three, de five deaths within a matter of thirty minutes, right? And so then on Sunday, as um, Mr. Sparks made the statement about him and TJ being down on Miller Street on Friday, and then Saturday a kid was killed on Sunday. The people were down at, at the uh, Miller store, and they were all mourning the loss of Mr. Corey, at which time the Fort Worth Police Department was there, but they were on the outskirts. And so the people were saying, why are they here? Why are they there? And there was a lot of chaos back and forth. However, I took the time to walk up to the officers, and I asked them it would be better if y'all would just come over with everyone so it doesn't look like y'all are singling them out. As a matter of fact, I got the officers to actually pray with the family that was out there. They kneeled and they talked and created a conversation. Not all officers were bad, just like not all councilmen and things like that. I remember uh, Maddie Parker, when you first became mayor, how we sat down and talked. Uh, since then, we haven't had a conversation. Uh, also with several different people, we would like to combine things back in the community and create a table that we can have a community conversation and find out what we need to do. We know the problem, we just need a solution. We need to stop being reactive and proactive as it relates to our children in our community to change it so our children are not, instead of singing praises as we drive into the funerals, actually singing their praises after they've graduated and created a family and become productive citizens in their community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Martasha James by phone, followed by Pastor Key of Tatum. Ms. James? 
Yes. Hello. Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm sticking on the youth. Um, and time and time again, we are giving sad news that some youth has died. Um, I'm sorry. Some youth has died or caught within some sort of gun violence and violence period, or from the people who have already spoken before me, stating how our children are literally behind the learning curve. We need to stop with the labeling theory when it comes to them as well. Instead, let's implement programs that give our children a different way of thinking and career opportunities. Not everyone wants to go to college or can yet afford it. Beneficial programs are geared to redirecting and providing restorative justice for before they're in trouble or even wearing an ankle monitor or sent to alternative schools. Programs that help with steering our children in the right way, for instance, Cars have changed. Phones have changed. You can shop from your phone and get the item the same day. The way people vote have changed, even off for curbside services. Yet the way we get our kids involved and interested in education is still the same. We need to encourage them to better themselves, being something other than professional athletes. People, people who film the movies, not the actors, make more than the actors. More programs like Big Thought should be throughout the Fort Worth community. And they are hitting the numbers and have two years left with the CCPD. So that is something that we should consider when it comes to redirecting and giving our youth a different way of doing things, a different outlet of having something other than the streets to be involved in. Thank you. Ms. James, thank you. Um, Pastor Kiev Tatum, followed by Jack Bowen. Mayor and Council, a Fort Worth police captain who was formerly a deputy chief before being demoted is suing the city claiming she was retaliated against by Chief Neil Notes for holding officers accountable. The civil suit is asking for the captain, Paula Conaway, to be reinstated in her deputy chief position and monetary damages between 250,000 and 1 million. Conway, Conway insists on accountability of the officers she commands. As a result, she was retaliated against, harassed, humiliated, and ultimately demoted by the chief of police. In February 2021, when Conaway was still a deputy chief, in the suit it states she was assigned to a case surrounding an internal affairs investigation into an officer due to a traffic stop where the officer reportedly punched an unresistant driver in the face repeatedly. A grand jury case against the officer led to an indictment afterwards. Department has 45 days to complete an internal investigation. And on last week, you settled a $10 million lawsuit to our former chief of police and others who had the exact same complaint against our city. Not only did you settle a complaint, if you look closely at the July use of force numbers, nothing has changed in the fact 45% of excessive use of force is against the black community. We hear in the community the same thing. They use fear, intimidation, and terror to the point of torture. We're repeatedly having to come back and clean up what someone does in this city, and they're never held accountable. I do not think Chief Notes is the man for the job. He's not ready. Give him 10 years, he may be. But what I discovered in this process, he's been one of the most disingenuous and dishonest person and has used the practice of Jim Crow uh, racism to divide the black leadership so that some of our leaders 
will be supportive of his actions. Our next speaker is Jack Bowen the council, by Carolyn Minnesota Rodriguez. Work. Thank you, Pastor Kibb. Have, Thank you, Mr. Kibb. Have, Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Jack Bowen, followed by Carolyn Rodriguez. Good evening, I'm Jack Bowen. I live in North Fort Worth, Chisholm Ridge neighborhood, south side of the Alliance area. In, largest NPO beat in North Fort Worth, it's big. The good news is that we and a bunch of our neighborhoods, nine apartment complexes and several schools have in my opinion by far the best NPO that we have ever had. Officer Bobby Sanchez, badge 4827. Terrific communicator, responsive uh, example. She and others in the North Division recently shut down a house 100 feet from mine that was allegedly openly selling guns on the front lawn and substances inside all right across the street from the school. The bad news, we do not currently have an NPO or not an active one because Officer Sanchez was seriously injured on a burglary of motor vehicles detail July 3rd, when she was assaulted by a suspect with a long rap sheet who'd injured other officers too. She received major jaw injuries, TMJ. Well, because the city's workers' compensation medical network contains zero, none, zilch, not a oral surgeons. This is in the nation's 11th largest city. She still not received the surgery that three medical professionals based on MRIs, CAT scans, and X-rays right after the incident, July 3rd, said she immediately needs. Instead, she is suffering, cannot eat normally, and instead is bogged down in red tape with intermediaries who are paid for by our tax dollars, but who keep putting her off. So as our city leaders, I'm here tonight to ask you to please use your influence to get this situation resolved, please. Those of us who depend on Bobby are concerned first for her well-being and yes, second, for the loss of PD responsiveness to our neighborhoods. Nobody's watching the school zones for us right now. And third, for what we hear may mean the early release of the offender because of failure to provide the legal system with the timely opinion of a qualified oral surgeon regarding the extent of the injuries that she sustained. That poses an unnecessary risk to our city and to all of society. And I thank you in advance for looking into it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Our next speaker is Carolyn Rodriguez, followed by Bill Bergen by phone. Hello. I'm Carolina. I'm in Elizabeth's um, section there. I was going to say the speech to, to Chuck over there, but I guess he left. So I guess he's going to probably watch it later. So basically, I was looking at his bio, and he's got a really impressive bio. He's got 20 years active service. He was deployed four times. He, had, he was deployed to Iraq three times, to Afghanistan one time, and he took an oath to the Constitution. And he saw, like, devastation and mistreatment of citizens over in those other countries. But he, he, he was over there to fight for freedom. And so they kept each other focused by telling each other they were fighting for freedom. That's how they get those kids to shoot those 50 cows off the top of, the, the, off the top of those um, big, big uh, hummers. They tell the kids, oh, yeah, you're fighting for freedom, so go ahead and shoot. It doesn't matter. That's how they get them to keep going. So I was surprised today when he, in today's meeting, when they were talking about animals at the animal shelter, he had to say, just like those idiotic, dumb First Amendment auditors, I ignore them. Hmm. Does he say... Just like those dumb, idiotic Hispanics, I ignore them. Does he say, just like those dumb, idiotic Palestinians, so I ignore them. I ignore them. Before he was sitting up there, and I know he's not here, but I know he's going to be watching. Before he was sitting there, up there on his throne, a lot of things happened that he had no idea about. And so we had a police officer kill Atiana, a young lady in her home, and there's lots of other police brutality cases still going on. So the city commissioned an expert review board, and they paid a million dollars to explain the culture of the police department and what they could do to fix it. And right after the report was released, the chief stood right here in this spot I'm standing and said, I'm going to have transparency, I'm going to have accountability, but we don't see it. We don't see it at all. So um, we haven't seen it from him. We haven't seen it from anywhere else. So there's no place for the citizens to go for help. The citizen review board was handpicked by the police. 
the city council, most of you guys were elected because of campaign money from the police. So who are you, who's, what side are you guys gonna vote on? On page 31 of the expert review board panel, uh, uh, it said that in one, they were talking about retaliatory fighting and, and how the police do, do a lot of retaliation. And I quote from the, from the thing. In one instance, an officer, after having lost control of a drunk woman while he was trying to arrest, got kicked in the face by another woman who was being held by a security guard. In response, he, put, he punched her in the face several times. And when, when he was discussing it with his corporal, his corporal laughed and said, said did you let her have it? And, he, and the corporal laughed and said, asked if he was okay. So I want to talk really quick about my deal. Um, first of all, as, as you guys think I'm a First Amendment auditor, but none of you all have talked to me. But you don't even really know anything about what we do because as you guys are representing the people in your little constituent people, I'm representing all those people who are afraid of the police, the ones that don't call the police for help. That's what my camera's doing. It's bringing awareness to what's really happening out there. And I'm losing my time right now, but they, they lied to you about how I got hurt. That's all I got to say about that. Oh, why am I the bad guy? I'm being charged with, with three crimes. When I got my ass kicked by the cops, and I'm Council, being charged by three crimes. that's the conclusion of our speakers. We can't meet Mr. Bergen, so meeting is dismissed. Adjourned.